I'd like to thank, I, I, I will be reading from text because I haven't got the fluency in either Gaelga or Berlin. <laughs> that they can't, or that Liam has it either. So I'll be reading from this text in case I leave anything else to you. I'd like to thank Philip for being so gracious, for being gracious enough to launch my book. <coughs> he has a huge pressure of work between the Abbey and the Senate, and it's extremely kind of him to take time out uh, in the present circumstances of the country to, uh, to come along here tonight. I'm really grateful that he did so. I'd also like to thank the staff of the castle who do tremendous work in keeping the castle in good order and in keeping the grounds in excellent condition. The garden here is absolutely marvellous, uh, beautifully laid out, and anybody who hasn't, we, 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 we came here tonight in a bit of, it was starting to get dark, but it's really worth coming to see uh, the way it's laid out and the patterns and all the rest. Now, <coughs> to say something about Drimley Castle, Drimley Castle was the western outpost of the Norman settlement in Dublin going back to the 13th century. The Irish clans of the O'Borns and the O'Tools constantly harassed the Norman settlers and Drimley Castle was an important bulwark and warning post against these attacks. Now to put the castle, to put this in, in context, we've got to learn something, remember something about what Ireland was like when the Normans came first. The O'Borns and the O'Tools once occupied large tracts of land on the flatlands and the good pastures of Kildare, but they were driven into the mountains when the Norman invasion happened. The two clans, fabulous, uh, uh, hugely important clans, forged alliances through intermarriage and soon declared war on the new inhabitants of Dublin, the, the, the Anglo Normans. These clans held their ground in the Dublin Mountains, in the Wicklow Mountains, all through the 14th and 15th centuries. In, in 1390, the Earl of Ormond and the Lord Lieutenant captured Oakbourne Castle in, in Wicklow Town. But the O'Toole's counterattacked, and spiked the heads of 60 English soldiers on the gates of O'Toole's Castle. Uh, power score, what we know as power score today. There's no record of these clans ever succeeding in capturing Grimley Castle. Yet the record showed that the Barnwells, who owned the castle, played an important part in defending the city from these constant attacks. And it's recorded that Wolfram the Barnwell was, was rewarded for the part he played in the Battle of Sagard in 1294. In later times, the castle was significant. In the war, in the war of 1641, which was basically a sectarian war between Catholics and Protestants in this country, <coughs> long before William of Orange came, <coughs> and which was seen uh, was seen as a sectarian war. It was important at the time of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, we have Cromwell's Fourth Row there in Watmouth, and we have Cromwell's Quarters quite nearby, mm -hmm. down in Kilmainham. So Cromwell was about the place here with his army. And then in the era of George III, who was probably one of the most important kings of England ever, uh, William Petty, Lord Lansdowne, who owned the castle, was Prime Minister of England. So <coughs> the castle has, uh, has uh, quite a lot of history attached to it. Um, now, to move on to another thing, because I'm primarily a poet, not necessarily a, a good poet or a bad poet, <laughs> but, uh, but primarily I'm a poet. I like to write poetry when I get the chance. I wrote one, I wrote a new poem there. I couldn't get Liam to read it, he was too busy. But, <coughs> but uh, it was the first poem I've written in over a year, and sometimes it takes a year or two years before you write a poem. But poems just come. Well, they come to me anyway. And if, if they don't come, I don't bother, you know. So, <coughs> so to talk about literature, right? There have been two historical works of literature centred on Drimnet Castle. The Rose of Drimnet, written by R.D. Joyce, 
which I have included in the book. <coughs> this story is so well told that it probably accurately describes similar events that actually occurred at some time during the 300 years that the barn walls were present in the castle. It's important to remember that the barn walls came to Ireland with King John, who was the most popular monarch, English monarch, ever to set foot in Ireland, apart maybe from Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> All the chieftains of Ireland pledged allegiance to King John, including the O'Neills and the O'Connors, who were actually the most important clan in the west of Ireland at the time. And they all came to Dublin to welcome King John. And the reason they did so was because he came here with an army and drove out the Delacys, who had previously come with his father, Henry II, and who had confiscated all the land and driven the Irish out of the pale, as it was at the time. But King John came here and made pacts. And the Irish chieftains at the time Primarily what they wanted was, they wanted the benefits of English law in Ireland. Now that sounds very alien to our ears, but that's what the great chieftains of Ireland wanted. They wanted the protection of English law from the Norman barons. So, there was a certain, uh, there was a moment of peace when King John was here, 1210. So it's not unlikely that the romance, as depicted in R.D. Joyce's famous Rose of Drimna, could actually have happened. Obviously, it's a story that he made up, but it very well fits King's uh, periods in history. 